Hi everyone, I'm Gary Benson, um, G Benson on IRC usually. I work for Red Hat on the debugger team, um, basically on GDB for the past few years. Um, and the project I've been working on is called Infinity. Can you turn the mic up? I can't, I can't hear you very well. It's not attached to anything. It's not attached to anything. Oh. He, he has to speak louder. Oh, right, sorry. Okay, I'll speak louder. <laughs> All right, so first up, what is Infinity? It's a little kind of single sentence. It's a platform independent system for basically, it's a platform independent system for applications to expose some extra functions to software development tools like, um, you know, debuggers, monitors, um, and other analysis tooling. So, um, I guess throughout this talk, I'm going to say, you know, Infinity is tool agnostic. It's not aimed at any particular tool, but I'm probably going to say GDB and debugger a lot because that's kind of where I'm coming from. So, that's what it is. Why? Why do we need it? Um, some, uh, some aspects of some applications need to be kind of understood by, um, by the tooling you're using. So, for example, you may be working on an application and it's using multiple threads. And on your platform, um, the, the threading functionality is provided by libpthread.so, which is the, the threaded library. Um, so if you're, you, so any, any tools that you then use to, connect, to examine this application, they need to know that if they see libpthread.so, if they see the threading library, then your application is doing something extra, and they need to, um, they need to do this extra bit, which for the threading library, there's a second library, the thread debugging library, which then your the the tool, the debugger or whatever, has to then find and load, and it can use these functions then to introspect your application and find out, in this case, the threads that your application is using. So, um, as a in a kind of diagram, it looks like this. So you've got your application uh, up there on the left. And the tool, the debugger, the monitor, is accessing your application somehow, and that's the red line. Um, and the tool has loaded the thread debugging library to see what your application is doing with the threading library. So already there's, there's a fair amount of knowledge that we're baking into the, um, that has to be baked into the tool to make all this work. So. Any tools that are going to deal with threaded applications here need to know that if they see the thread library, then they need to load the thread debugging library. And they also need to know that if, if your application is statically linked, then it may be threaded anyway. So it may need the thread debugging library anyway. Um, the tools all need to know where to find the thread debugging library um, with, that relates to the threading library that you've loaded. Um, and there's no there's no standard way to do all this. Um, uh, it's it's just a pattern. So um, the you know the thread libthreaddb the thread debugging library is just one one example of a debug library. It's probably the most common, but there are other there are other debug libraries that are used to um, examine runtime linker internals um, and the open M open MP, the parallelization stuff is. Um, either proposing or have written their own debug library. Um, and this, so this kind of stuff has to be, you know, each, each debug library has to be written kind of individually. And the, the rules for finding the debug library have to be written. Um, and also for how to, how to check kind of versions, like the lib, the, the threading library and the thread debugging library are kind of, the thread, the thread debugging library is looking at internal structures in the threading library, so they have to make sure that they're, um, for the same versions or whatever, and the same compiler, and all these issues like can be and they are currently handled. Um, you know, the thread debug library works and it has for um, however many years it's existed for most situations. <coughs> so, but if I go back to the, this is the. Um, this is a graphic we just looked at, so the tool, the application, and the two libraries. Um, but this picture is not complete. There's, 
in here also is the C library, the, the system C library. So your application is linked to the C library, the threading library is linked to the C library, and your tool is linked to the C library and also the thread debugging library. And this is fine if you're using like a, a homogeneous environment, if you know everything's running on your laptop or everything's running on one computer somewhere. Um, but it's not fine in a heterogeneous environment. So if you have different architectures, say, you know, your tool is running on your laptop and your application is on some ARC64 server somewhere. Or, and it's also not, um, it also doesn't work in containers where maybe all this is running on the same computer, but the, the C library in your application's container is not the same as the C library in your tool container. And in this, in this particular case, um, the C library is going to look like it's the correct architecture, but it may well be built for a different operating system, and it may well then just um, it may just crash your debugger when you load it. So this is kind of um, this is kind of why I've started been working on this project. Um, obviously, you can make special builds of the debug libraries that uh, you know it's built for this thread library, but it's linked again. That's against that thread library, but then you have a kind of matrix of different um, builds of the debug library that you have to maintain and it kind of gets out of hand. So, so okay, so in order to, in order to um, kind of replace libthreadDB with something else, uh, can I have a look at like what does, what does libthreadDB do? Well, it, export, it has a bunch of functions that it exports to the tool um, so they're all in in the thread debug in the in terms of the functions that GDB uses in the thread debugging library, they're all information to get they're all functions to get information about a specific thread, or to and there's a there's a function that allows it to iterate over all the threads. But unlike a lot of other libraries, libthreadDB is kind of uh, it's like double-ended, it exports functions to the tool but it also imports functions back from the tool so um, it's, um, it's kind of importing amongst the functions for the tool so uh, the debugger or whatever would say can I have the, uh, I don't know, the priority of this particular thread and then the thread debugging library then comes back to the, the tool and says okay can I have the, can I have the contents of this block of memory or can I have the registers of, can I have this register from this thread? Um, so the thread debugging library is essentially driving the debugger, the, the tool, the, um, it's kind of handing over the steering wheel to the thread debug library um, just for a little while and then it comes back with whatever the, the, the debugger has asked for. Um, and the solution that I've picked, I've kind of been working on for Infinity is um, to have platform independent functions, the kind of equivalent of what the thread debug library has, um, stored in the actual library. So in, in libp thread, for instance, if you have your, you know, your application is using the thread library, the thread library contains the actual thread library code that it usually does and as well. It has these little functions that allow um, <coughs> allow a debugger or a tool to call into it and say what is this and it would come back. So this approach of having platform independent functions in the actual, the kind of regular library means that locating the functions is trivial. Like if your application is using this library then the, the, the tool can see that here's the library, here's the actual file, the library that you're, that you're application is using and here in that file is these infinity functions that I can use. Um, it also means that, that the tools don't need to know that some particular library is accessed via some other particular debug library. If, it, if, you're, if, you, can, if you connect your application with a debugger and it finds uh, infinity functions to access certain threading things then it knows that okay your application is maybe threading so I'll, I'll maybe call these functions to find out what about it. Uh, I've gone ahead of myself a little bit. Yeah. 
sorry. Um, and also, this, this method works nicely with static linking. It, and it doesn't really matter where the functions are, where the, where the infinity functions are. So if, you, if your library got its threading code from dynamically loading libprefred.so, then the debugger can see that. If your library got the thread in, if your application got the thread in library because it was statically linked in, then as long as the infinity functions have, have followed it, then um, the debugger can see that. Um, and graphically, this, this looks like that. Um, <coughs> sorry. Okay. Yeah, this is kind of that as a graphic. Uh, there's no kind of separate library. You just have your debug functions um, in the regular library. So what can this be used for? The obvious first case is thread debugging, because that's the the one that I've been kind of working on already. Um, another potential use is for when uh, applications load libraries into di different linker name spaces, um, which has been relatively uncommon on, on Linux at least for um, up until now maybe because it didn't work properly in glibc, but it's been fixed. So. Um, yeah, applications are basically the debugger would at the moment if a debugger loads um, if the application loads a library in a different namespace then GDB at least won't see that. And there's no way for the C library, glibc that has no way to export that so as far as GDB is concerned your program has gone off into some code that it has no idea what it is. Um, Another potential use I mentioned earlier is OpenMP, um, which has its uh, own uh, debug library to access various um, <laughs> things about uh, what it's doing. ASAN and TSAN, address sanitizer and thread sanitizer from uh, Clang. Is it Clang? Do people say Clang? Yeah. Um, they currently use hacks to calculate things that are not exported and these kind of things where a tool bakes in knowledge of, a, um, of the kind of internals of something else is, is a really like is the kind of basic use case for it um, and the final potential use that I thought of so far is uh, pretty printers that glibc has like currently they're, they're written in python um, and the actual Python code has two parts. One part is the finding the thing you're trying to print, and the other part is actually printing it. So the um, the printing bit is obviously would still stay in Python, but the actual the bit of finding it and coding all the structure offsets and stuff is really nicely suited for um, Infinity. So the what are the components of this? There's a compiler which um, takes kind of uh, a kind of textual source and turns it into dwarf byte code wrapped in a little chunk that goes inside the binary or shared library and there's also a, a tester which allows you to write um, unit tests and um, it, allows you to, it allows you to write basically a unit test and the, the function itself um, at the same time which I I kind of think it's pretty important because these functions are kind of for tooling, so um, like you know they're for software development tools, so that it puts a kind of um, like a late discovery of error into it, where so say it could if things like the thread debugging functions in glibc were not really going to be used in glibc until you start debugging an application with it, so it could potentially have a glibc gets built and shipped, and it has a, if it has a broken thread debug note, then the first thing you're going to find is if some user tries to debug something and it, the thread debugging is broken. So I I've, I've wanted to make it as easy as possible for people to write complete test cases um, in the code they ship. Uh, the other thing, there's a client library which is um, it's written in C, and that kind of help allows applications to kind of uh, manage and execute the functions. And I've got currently a set of um, a set of replacements for the lib thread DB functions that GDB needs. There's kind of five of them, I think. Um, 
And there's also a lot of, since I did this, since I last presented this, a lot of the questions were based on the lines of, well, we'd really like to use this, but we'd also like to still have a libfreddb so that we don't have to change anything. So um, I've kind of also now written a, I've kind of been integrating this into glibc's libfreddb so that if if you are um, if you're uh, trying to debug a program using glibc and it, and you load libfreddb like normal, um, you'll if if your libfreddb has infinity support and your glibc has infinity support, then you'll use infinity rather than um, rather than the kind of existing setup. And I, I was just curious what. What role does the client library play? Like, what sort of? It's like a it's a bytecode interpreter, basically. But okay. and does it? So. Like, does it find the bytecodes for you? Because then don't you need that same kind of callback? It doesn't. Yeah, there is a callback. It doesn't. Um, the client library knows nothing about ELF, so I'm kind of anticipating that any program that's. Any program that's kind of looking at binaries and things has already kind of got some kind of ELF decoder in it. Um, so you kind of you kind of provide the client library with the notes as just the blocks of data that are. The, you kind of pass it the encoded functions, which are at the moment the only place to find them is in ELF notes. So. Well, like you have to dig that out. You have to dig that out. Kind of yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not. I mean, even. Um, there's a certain amount of things like um, I'm going to dig myself in a hole here now because I yeah I mean there's there's other stuff as well like that you know if if you're say you're like say you're a debugger you're accessing this stuff you it's not just the actual those bits of the ELF file that you need you need the other you need other stuff that you need to be able to relocate and stuff like that to be able to read the addresses so it's kind of like I kind of thought of it as, I can't think of a of an a way, an application that would use it that has not already got this stuff. I can't think the application could could um, could support libfreddb as it is without already having all this stuff. So um, any kind of other stuff is that like extra or at least future. Um, yeah, and I'm, I mentioned okay, GDB integration is the last part. Um, initially, that was kind of the the final component, and there was no um, wrapper inside libfreddb, but now the GDB integration is kind of into the past version 1.0 or whatever. So um, that's not a current thing. Um, kind of how long does this talk go? It's till half past? I'm going to skip. I got some code, but I'm going to skip it, I think. Um, you still have 20 minutes. I still have 20 minutes. All right, I'll make you look at the code. <laughs> anyway, I'll do it really quick because nobody wants to look at code. Basically, this is a lib. This is a function in libthreaddb. It's getting the address of a symbol. It's doing some little special case logic with it, and that's what it looks like in C. And the infinity version of it is basically the same length. It's getting the. It's, it's loading the thing, doing the little special case. Do I go here? Do I go here? Do I go here? And that's it. So, I'll not talk about that anymore. This, um, I guess, this sort of shows that um, what you will be writing if you're writing notes. So it's kind of um, uh, the kind of general features. The functions have a name in the namespace. Um, in this case, the function has one argument. Um, the, the actual functions are written in dwarf bytecode, which I'm sure you all know what it is. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of stack-based language. So this function has one argument, which means when you arrive at the top of the function, the caller has put that argument on the stack. Um, and your, this function here returns two values, so your function is expected to return these two values. And this is, this is checked by the compiler, so um, there's a... Yeah, it's, it's checked by the compiler. It's also checked by the um, the client library when you load it. But um, at the moment, the compiler checks the stack, but it doesn't lay it out 
because I don't know how to do that. Um, I'm hoping that at some point in the future someone else who knows more about compilers than me will be having to write these notes and they'll go, this is easy, I'll do it. But not now. Um, okay, I'm not going to walk through this function, but just to, this just kind of exists. This is to point something out. This is a um, another thread debugging note to get the address of a, a TLS block or thing to get some kind of uh, value from thread local storage or the address rather. And I put this function in just to point out that what this one's doing here is it's calling another infinity function, but this function is in the runtime linker. So um, it's kind of to illustrate that they kind of come from multiple sources. Like at the moment, libthreadDB is, is accessing runtime linker internals in a way that means that if you were to so if you were to have a libp thread from one G libc with the runtime linker of another with different structure offsets, it would fail. Um, and if, whereas if you're using infinity, it's accessing it through an infinity function in the runtime linker, so um, it kind of opens the door for that kind of thing to be done. I'm not sure if there's any demand for it, but it means it's kind of safe. How is linking of these, like, if they're in different shared objects, mm -hmm. how does this find the so when your um, so when your tool kind of attaches or starts to inspect your process, um, it at the, like the way G, where I am doing it in GDB is it's looking at the actual files that you've loaded. Um, so when GDB goes through and starts adding the objects of the of the application that you attach to or whatever, it's going to add the runtime linker and then those those fun functions from the runtime linker get given to the client library and then it carries on and it adds the thread library and it adds those functions to the client library and I guess so I guess the answer is the client library links them. Um, the, uh, there's kind of a, a kind of callback mechanism so when you add you kind of give the client library the encoded functions and then it tells you that functions have become available so you only a function only appears in the debugger when like in this case, if you added this, the encoded form of this function, um, but the runtime linker function wasn't there, then this function would not appear in the debugger. So the debugger would not would kind of assume you had no TLS support. So um, the kind of the functions arrive at the debugger kind of more piecewise than than they do with libthreadDB. It's like. Um, uh, the idea is that uh, infinity is platform independent, I understand, but mm -hmm. when we see calls to, uh, for example, underscore, underscore, link, map, TLS, mod ID, mm -hmm. that looks like uh, relatively specific. Uh, we will probably not find this if we use GDB to debug a Windows well, application. Well, no, this, 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 this thing here um, is the name of another infinity function. Okay, so, so you reuse some of the names? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, but this then should map them on, I don't know, I know nothing about Windows, mm -hmm. but uh, is the thread, uh, let's say, mechanism and so on used on Windows for TLS mapping this structure? Um, well, again, I don't, know nothing, I don't know anything about Windows either, but um, the kind of idea is that the the set of functions that the debugger sees is um, it's kind of like an API. So if if the debugger sees that you've got this function thread get TLS address, then it knows that that concept is there. So it doesn't matter whether how this is implemented. Um, like this is the implementation from glibc, whereas a Windows implementation would almost certainly look completely different. And it maybe wouldn't have the concept of a runtime link or a module ID. Um, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Cool. You uh, understood the level at which this was done. No, it's clear. Uh -huh. <coughs> um, let's have a quick look. This is a test case that for one of the functions. Um, 
It's kind of the the way I've been doing the test cases is this implement thing just says uh, it kind of just like stubs out all the functions that it's going to use, then it calls the function and checks that the result is as it is. It's like a it's a test case. So this is a, so you have a Python wrapper of, of of the client of the client library. Is that yeah yeah. Okay. Yeah, because that is, okay. So yeah, when this Python, yeah, you're calling the uh, the library. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, the current status of all this lot, um, the note compiler is complete, but it needs documenting. The note tester is complete, but it needs documenting, and it needs more tests. Um, the client library is complete, but it needs documentation. <laughs> can see the pattern. And some more tests. Um, the client library actually has quite a lot of tests, but it doesn't have it doesn't have tests that would validate the specification, which in itself I haven't completely finished writing. Um, but like the specification says that this this byte code should do exactly this and exactly that, and um, so I need to write a lot of tests for byte code that doesn't do that. Um, Oh, yeah. Which is not there. Um, I have the stuff to create the broken bytecode, but I don't have the, the. You know, I haven't sat there and turned away at writing them all yet. Um, I've got a set of glibc um, Peter notes. The one, the ones that GDB needs. Um, they're all complete. Most have tests. The, the API that they export isn't documented, but that's relatively simple. Um, I don't know if there's any glibc people here, but I'm hoping to get a patch mailed by February the 16th. That's my date, so um, kind of I'm kind of working on getting this all kind of in fairly soon, hopefully. Um, uh, the libthreadDB, the kind of integration part of it is is there. There's a there's a little GDB modification that it needs, which is currently native only, so that's. Um, uh, that's future work, and yeah, the uh, the GDB integration bit that I mentioned earlier is um, kind of post 1.0, so um, it's not done yet. Um, so, uh, how stable is is the note format and the the, uh, the byte code? Um, I'm hoping very stable. Um, it's. Because I don't like, I can't even remember why I decided to call it Infinity. But as, as it, as things progressed, I spent a lot of time thinking, if something is, if something's going to change here in the future, how do I make it so that it fails gracefully, so that um, it's, it's hopefully got a lot of kind of built-in stuff so that you can easily say that this is not relevant anymore, this is unsupported, or it is now supported. Um, so that older, older stuff using newer features can gracefully fail. Um, I, like time will tell if I've actually managed that. Um, let's see if I can find. Uh, I show you a demo, but it's not very exciting because it's just. Um, it's essentially looks exactly like GDB normally. <laughs> Let's see if I can get this. Come on. All right. Are you seeing something we are? Yeah, I'm trying to get this to. Um, <laughs> there we go. My mind went completely blank and I couldn't remember what key. Hello. Did that just change colours then? That's a horrible to see. So we change the colours. That looks good. Is one of these going to be black or white? No, it's there, isn't it? Grey on black. Black on white. Right. Um, 
Can everybody see that? Um, okay, so there's an example process. Five, seven, three. And so if I open another tab, is that going to... Oh, where am I? Okay. Has that gone back to being small again? So if I go... TV. And... Tell it to load the... Should have done this in advance. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there we go. such an anticlimax. What did I say it was? 573. There you go. Whoa. It's got a block. Um, and we can go info. This is a statically linked program with uh, two threads. And so it's also got a TLS variable which is So, but wait a minute, it is loading libthreaddb. It's loading libthreaddb, yeah, but that libthreaddb is using infinity. Exactly, it's his one, you know, the one in Word. Oh, it's infinity. a fake. Libfred yeah, DB. because at the last time I did this talk, everybody asked, everybody said, well, this is great, but can we actually have a libthreaddb on our system? You want the new stuff <laughs> looking like the old one, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. and change without change. I'll show you uh, with, if I show you it with the debugging, like tracing switched on. Type all that stuff in again. What was it? Set. Lib thread to be search path work. This actually hurts. <laughs> You know, 573. You should see a ton of bytecodes get executed now. Oh. So there you are, there's stuff happening. <laughs> so if I do that, the, print the TLS variable again, uh -huh. you will get some more bytecodes. Not a huge amount, like, uh, you can see it's, hot. it's actually quite a complicated, where's the start? The start is about there. And it's going into this function get TLS base, and then it's also calling. Um, it's going into like it goes into this. This is all thread debugging stuff, but then it goes into the runtime linker notes and starts pulling stuff out from there. Um, and yeah, prints a number, and uh, and that's it, I think. So um, this is probably a stupid question, but the client library is actually running the bytecode. Yes. That's right. okay. Yeah. All these, like each, yeah, here's these, that's kind of the bytecodes column. The ones with IAX are kind of uh, extra ones that the client library put in. They're not, they're not actually in the note. Um, the <laughs> well, no, no, the, these <laughs> ones are, um, <laughs> these ones are in the uh, thing. Um, did you see Andreas talk on the pieces? No. Oh. Do, do you implement the of these? What's that? 
probably no. not. <laughs> probably at answers no. <laughs> you... Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I'll just put all this stuff on the screen, and then any further questions I will answer. Yeah, I, have, I have a couple of questions. Uh -oh. One is, does this let you remove the FreeDB from GDB server? Um, currently, no, but it would it kind of, at the moment, the, um, the way it's going to work is you load, GDB is still going to load libthreadDB, um, but I, for th the next thing that I have in my kind of sites is the multiple namespace thing, and there is no debug library written for that, and I don't intend to write one now. So, yeah, so what my kind of, once this is all in glibc, in the libthreadDB and in the libpthread, um, my kind of next thing is then to make gdb access the infinity functions by itself without needing libthreadDB. Um, and then it will be able to do it. And it will all happen in gdb. Um, will it happen in gdb? No, it probably would make sense to have it in gdb server as well. Yeah. But, I think it would be nice to have it not in GDB server, mm -hmm. just because that's an added thing. If you have a GDB server implementation, it's just an added complicated thing it has to do. But then you would have, if so you have your GDB server, and your application creates a new thread, and GDB server has to communicate with GDB to handle that. But, G, I mean, or does it? Just evaluating some little script and getting some stuff, GDB could do that. Yeah, it would be totally possible. Say what? If FreeDB is implemented internally using Infinity, there's right. nothing blocking GDB using a FreeDB that then right. interprets the opcodes yeah. in the host, yeah. even if connected to a GDB server. Then uh, you just have to load some version of libfreadDB that's compatible enough with the, the functions defined by Infinity. If you load some version that's using some opcodes, that's not familiar with the opcodes that are in the, in the binding. <coughs> Would fail. So if you load a new enough, the thread B should be backwards compatible. Mm, yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess yeah, the like the the kind of ultimate idea is that that GDB just won't need libthreadDB. It won't ever pick it up. Um, then it just, just in the, it, then it becomes a little implementation detail. It's just that piece of code that's a bridge between GDB and the hmm. Infinity library. It's either a chunk inside GDB or it's a separate library. But it's the same thing. Yeah, for thread you, for thread. So actually, it's like you pick libthreadDB and you can copy paste it. You know, the, the new implementation. Hmm. It's like if, if you copy it inside the feed, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, like the um, um, for just thread debugging, yeah, it's it's no difference whether it's in libthreadDB or whether it's in GDB. But once you start adding extra things like DLM open. Um, it doesn't make sense. To, that obviously doesn't live in the FreadDB. Um, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me to write a new library. To me, it does because <coughs> because then you're going to expose a few entry points in infinity terms, like mm -hmm. get TLS address, this thread maybe needed. And those will be defined entry points, defined in terms of infinity functions, right? Yeah. And something will need to be aware of these entry points. Mm -hmm. And there will be some C code that will call into some infinity interpreter saying, run this infinity function. Mm -hmm. And there will be di different tools that will want to do the same thing and call into the same entry points. Mm -hmm. with red both GDB, LLDB, and other debuggers, little view, whatever, 
they will all want to call the same entry points. And that can be wrapped in a small shim library that exposes like five C functions. Mm -hmm. And you don't see infinity at all. Right? It's implemented inside that shim library. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I save work from for the different tools. So say, well, I guess like they can they can do kind of different things. Like there's once, like at the moment, all the thread debug stuff is is in its own block, whereas once kind of debuggers can actually access just an infinite a single infinity function, then there's no need for there's no need to have like functions blocked up like that. Like, what if you want to just access one single structure offset, do you want to write a whole library for that? Or would you like your, de your debugger, your tool, to be able to, to call a single function to get that? Well, I, I see it more in terms of glibc is going to expose a set of infinity entry points mm -hmm. that's going to grow over time. Mm -hmm. So you could have a matching library just like libc.db before. The glibc db. Libdldb. And that will grow entry points just like the infinity points grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I see that as a, as a viable option. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I think maybe I kind of need to sit down and talk about it and a, a little bit more comfortably than standing here. But like, <laughs> <laughs> I still have more questions. All right. Okay. My, my next one is. Are these notes like in a loadable section? Get them out of inferior memory? No, not at the moment. There's nothing to there's nothing to stop them being made that way if you want them to be. Um, they're not allocated, I think. What you're yeah, asking? You yeah, they live on the disk, but they don't live in memory. Um, I've I've kind of made it that way at the moment. Um, I've made it that way at the moment purely because um, all current. Um, like the for GDB to do this stuff now, it needs the files on the disk. Um, so, so it didn't make sense to put the stuff in memory for all inferiors when um, when it, it doesn't make GDB be able to do anything extra. Um, but like the client, like the client library is, it doesn't care where the functions come from. Like it doesn't care whether they're pu pulled out of memory or taken from disk because yeah. you just give it to them so I was just wondering about crazy I had two ideas one is if it's coming off the disk can you attach to a, a running program whose executable has been deleted hmm. you know and then if it's coming from memory is there a security issue with having an allocated section that has pointers to TLS things because some of that is mm. pointer mangled in GWC. At the moment, they're coming from the disk, and so you can't you can't attach to something that is executable has been deleted. It kind of it kind of went through my head. Oh, you could do all these things with with it, but then if the executable has been deleted, kind of there isn't a lot you can do with it. And from GDB terms, like I c if you know if some some other use case has that it is useful that the notes are loaded into memory. Um, I mean, the other thing is things like, um, like the th I think the thread debugging stuff is, I don't remember where it came from, but there's a kind of requirement that it can work without debug info installed. Whereas some of the other things like pretty printers, maybe, maybe the pretty, the infinity, if the pretty printers used infinity functions and those infinity functions could go in the debug info if there was a lot of them. Um, so. I, I have one more, uh, more crazy question, which is like, sometimes people want to be able to use GEB and like debug something that has green threads or there was like that, those Linux patches for debugging the Linux kernel mm -hmm. to understand its thread system. Is it possible that those systems could export these same functions? Would that actually work? Or are there other dependencies on the thread IDs in the system? And so you still need to teach GDP stuff to understand. I mean, if they're like, 
if the if the threading system you're interested in can fit into the the API of the notes that are currently there, then yeah, I guess no extra. There will be no extra work, but I'm not familiar with um, any other threading systems. There's so. two levels of things here. If you want to do that, like for supporting uh, better support for Go routines in, in GDB, currently GDB is not aware of Go routines. You're debugging Go and it lands inside the runtime. If the scheduler decides to change where the Go routine is running. And to, to, to support that, you need to come up with some API that debugger queries, like uh, some higher level entry points, like, t please tell me what is the kernel thread this go routine is running on right now. Or, uh, I want to schedule this go routine that's currently unscheduled, please hack the scheduler to make it runnable right now. So these are the entry points you need the level that the debugger needs to access. How it's implemented behind the scenes, how, how does the that component discover the, the structures inside the running program, where to poke in the scheduler? How do you describe those structures? That can be Python, that can be C. They have these advantages. They can be infinity. And then there's a, the advantage that, that it's architecture independent. So an infinity solves that layer of architecture independence, but you still need the higher level end reforms. And you need to be designed and yeah. specified. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a one, one other comment before you, you asked about um, moving the thread B to GDB. Yeah. That's one disadvantage to that, which is latency yeah. related, because you ask for um, print me variable, uh, TLS variable, and you notice the, the bunch of opcodes that ran yeah. when he showed that with logging enabled, a bunch of memory accesses back and forth, uh, just you know, follow some pointer pointer chasing. Yeah. If you do that on the server, then the host is going to ask the server, give me TLS base. That's one round trip on a potentially slow latency link, a few milliseconds perhaps. <laughs> if if you move that into all this implementation to the post, the the you, rest, so. have, may, you may have milliseconds for each of those. And if you have a hundred, then it can be noticed. It can slow you down. Yeah, I'm just thinking like, you know, first of all, I, I added the thread I DB I support to something and it's a nightmare. And I don't want to ever deal with that again. It'd be nice to <laughs> just remove it, you know. The worst was the, the callback in the face. Well, and then there's, yes, the callback stuff. But it seems to me like you'll you'll need something like that with this scheme because the notes require you to find the help file and extract some section from it. But like JDB server doesn't know how to do that. And generally, some other implementation probably wouldn't need to, wouldn't know how either, because nothing needs to, needs it right now. All right, so you can either make that a new requirement, or this libthreadDB shim will have to use that same symbol callback API to just look up a different symbol, like a magic symbol meaning send me the notes, or you know what I mean. So I mean, but if there's, but it's just some code. You have to find, you have to know about yeah, it's or, you know, the way I am. Um, the way I imagined it working for GDB server was that um, GDB and GDB server would both have the Infinity client library, and GDB would feed the notes to the one in the that it held. So GDB will be passing the elf. Because I guess with GDB server, you also have the thing. You sometimes you might have like um, some cut, some like strip binaries over here, and you have binaries with symbols over here. I think that's pretty common. Um, so the the GDB the GDB would be will be loading the notes and then sending them over to GDB server, which would then in, um, kind of it would maintain its own copy of the kind of 
like each CDB server would have its own copy of the notes and they would execute there to avoid the kind of latency. Um, GDB would uh, handle any symbol lookups that it had. Yeah, I mean, if it did relocation. like just shipping the data over and it was like that part of the GDB server and the callback thing is also just, it's very messy to implement. Yeah. You know, <coughs> the program. Don't ask me why it's done that way. Yeah, and you know, it, it is how it is, but it'd be nice if something new didn't work that way. It worked. <laughs> More like it's bizarre because the interface was copied from Solaris, mm -hmm. and the Solaris interface is function function pointer based on the table. Yeah, register yeah. this callback. Right. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't mean the lib thread DB part. I mean the part about um, GDB server. There's a special thing in the protocol to do this dance to get symbol back. Oh, uh, that little. This um, I know the bit you mean. That's. It's just kind of complicated and messy, and it'd be nice know. to have it be not messy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the Q symbol. Cool. Yeah. You can only do it at some specific point. Exactly. Right. Cut. Is anybody else? Okay. Yeah, I've I've kind of I've, I've tried to make it like as as generic as possible. So like, yeah, the at the moment you know the note compiler uses GCC, which generates ELF, but there's nothing there's nothing to stop. Um, there's nothing forbidden it in the standard or whatever the spec. Um, it's it's just it is elf at the moment because that's what it is. But they they're, they're kind of they're self-contained units. They don't rely on anything else from the elf file. They don't need the byte order or anything like that. So they exist kind of on their own. Cool. All right. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>